is receiving your DTMF here, convert that to IAM, initial address message. And this gives the order to this switch and this switch to provision a voice link and to prepare for communication, voice communication to happen. And this STP has to route all the message. Then there's some kind of okay, it works, then send ACM and you hear the phone ringing on your hand and the guy picks up the phone and then you see the connection and here you have voice communication. Attack quiz, who can tell me the problem here? Okay, sync, sync scanning, scene flooding. No? One, IAM attack, capacity denial of service. If you inject 32,000 packets, and it's very few 32,000 packets, you're going to provision 32,000 communication trunks, so voice carrying signal or lines, that are going to be way too much between this switch and this switch because nobody, no 32,000 people call from one location to another. In practice, that means that these two switches are not available anymore. If you're doing that a lot of time, you do a capacity denial of service on the whole network for the duration of the timeout of this whole state machine. Then release flow, let's say I hang up my connection. So basically, here what we get is a release message, let's say disconnect, then the two switch close the um, trunk, the, the voice trunk, and then you got a perfect release of the call, and a CDR is generated to tell how much to charge the calling user. What are the attacks? Guys, easy. Yeah, good point. Who is there? I don't know. Um, but which kind of denial of service? Uh, fake release, fake release, exactly. Fake release messages, which going to target one precise user. So you can do things like terminating any connection on the phone network. That is basic stuff. With some other protocol like INAP, Intelligent Networking Application Part, you can do something like Let's say I want to redirect all these phone numbers going to this number to this other number. Let's say the first number is an emergency service and the second phone number is a porn line. No problem, the phone, num the phone network will not know about it. Actually, for emergency service, this is, might not work on 112 or 991 because they are using special circuits and uh, software to provision this. Now, one thing that Tobias showed last, uh, last year is the usage of SRI message, send routing info, in order to know who is in which country by querying your ro roaming location. That's your roaming MSC. The MSC is in charge of a lot of phones. And if you're roaming to some other network, then MSC needs to be contacted if someone wants to reach you. So you can do this with cheap um, interfaces which are available for sale for anybody. But when you're inside the network, it's not basically uh, 150 euro for 10,000 lookups. It's basically free. You can inject as much as you want and the provider will be charged by usage of the bandwidth. We are talking of very small messages so you can track probably uh, the whole um, content of this conference for a whole year, it will go undetected. Yeah. Also, other targeted mobile attacks are with here a more complicated example, where you're using two VLR and one HLR to conduct the attack. The HLR is always in your home network. And by sending a fake location update, like this one, you can redirect a number which is in one network right now, roaming or not, on his home network or not, to another country. And of course, you're not in the other country. So let's say from here, we went from, well, I don't know here, it was Russia, to Kazakhstan. Then the guy won't receive any call to his phone number till you reset your phone. That means not moving to another location, that means rebooting your phone, really painful. 
Now, how to get with new parameters that are opening up? Femtocell is one thing which is very interesting because it gives you a part of the telecom in infrastructure. Uh, I come from a shitty town in the middle of France, and that's probably why I uh, went into hacking, otherwise I'll do bicycle races and getting <laughs> drunk. Um, and in my account, uh, basically side of this country, it's really low coverage and 3G, no, no, you don't have it. So you get a femtocell for the nice sum of 200 euro, and for this sum, what you get is actually a Linux router with IP connection, cables that you connect to your ADSL modem, and or ADSL router, more precisely. This established an IPsec tunnel. Make sure that you're connected inside the location of your network, because it would be too easy for me to take the femtocell to, let's say, uh, Hong Kong, and resell local termination cost in France from Hong Kong. Trust me, that's something that happens a lot. So, and that's mostly what the fraud department are chasing. But the problem is that this hardware is just armed with Montavista Linux, very insecure. You can root it probably in two minutes. And there's plenty of hats off to THC project for this. There have been a nice research project on that. So now the telco are raising uh, eyebrows and saying, okay, we, we need to, to take care of this. But the problem is very often what you see is binary vulnerability in things that were never audited. And it's huge. We are talking about lots of protocol uh, stacking up, and it's very not in the mindset of programmers to insert a person N or person P into their uh, entry, string entry, because why would someone do? They are much more like into, uh, what if someone dials repeatedly the same number? They always think reliability, never bad, hostile intention. So, what that gives access to is basically being able to control the insides of the IPsec tunnel, and from there you can inject any kind of dialect that is accepted by the remote network. And in this case, it's HNBAP and RANAP, which are protocol that deals with management of node Bs of the endpoints that collects the calls from callers and roaming from callers. Another one is SIP. Some people had the bright idea to say, oh, SS7 is very expensive. So what we're going to try is to replace SS7 with SIP. SIP works, it's something very nice, uh, manageable, you can even uh, do the headers and the, the signaling by hand. So let's replace the SS7 by SIP. Oh, wow, okay, we're missing a lot of information. So what happens is that they invented SS7 encapsulation into SIP messages. Right on. <laughs> this is great. So if you know uh, MIME, if you know SIP, you know SS7 encapsulation. And lots of session builder controller don't even know about this weird content. So why strip it? I don't know about it. Maybe it's important. And from external point of view, you can scan your SIP provider and try to inject SS7 message right in the SIP yeah, I see some people who are raising eyebrows and going, wow, yeah, I know what you're going to do next. <laughs> now, getting secure, manual SS7 testing is horrible, trust me. So that's why, um, basically, we try to automate that. I'll come to, to this later. Product testing is also a big thing. Um, we have things like uh, people getting concerned of replacing the Nortel or Alcatel switches with Huawei equipment. Really, what they are scared of is backdoors. So uh, it's OK to be backdoored by NSA or French services, but not by the Chinese. Go figure. <laughs> then automated scan of SS7 perimeters. That's OK. Hint, uh, what I do with P1Sec. Uh, the thing is, you can't really see the level of change that is happening into a telco organization. You go to anybody into the organization and ask him, OK, uh, can you draw me a map of the SS7? And you will do, but it will be always partial. You never have one person that have the global overview of things. And now we need it. And we need it badly because there are some people who are actually not only playing like we do or actually trying to do some security stuff, but who are injecting traffic for fraud. There are things really